Okay, good morning. Um, today is our last day of curriculum speech. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to announce uh, we have our chairman uh, to give us uh, the final, final talk of this quarter. Uh, Professor Vikram uh, Chandayala, who got his PhD in 1998 from the University of Illinois Champaign. And after two years of working in a software company called Ensoft, he joined the department in the year 2000. And since then, he has been uh, moving uh, smoothly uh, toward uh, the full professor, and now he is chairing the department, uh, starting from this quarter. And after he joined, uh, after he started to uh, chair this department, he came up with several new ideas in terms of trying to uh, change a better uh, graduate admission strategy and uh, several different uh, new ideas, uh, which hopefully will bring this department to a better position. Um, Vikram also uh, got uh, several uh, uh, pre prestigious awards, for example, the National Science Foundation Career Award, the NASA in, uh, Inventor Award, and also the Best Faculty Advisor Award. Uh, his research area is on large-scale simulation and also physics-based uh, computation. Uh, based, based on his research, he also uh, founded a uh, venture capital-based type of company uh, called Fizzwell. Okay. So today, based on his research experience as well as his uh, entrepreneurial type of research-based uh, uh, experience, he's going to give us uh, this talk. So let's welcome uh, uh, Vikram. Thank you, Jenning, and uh, good morning. And as uh, Jenning said, this is the last uh, talk of this quarter, so I can see that those students who fulfill their requirements won't show up today. I wouldn't if I was one of them, because uh, finals week is approaching as well. But thanks for those who showed up. So the idea here is that I want to uh, go through some experiences that I've had as, as a professor working with my students and on startups. And the hope is that some of these things are, are possible to translate to many other people in this department, in this college, in this university, because we, we are obviously in a changing climate of funding, and we want to see different ways to get funding, whether it's fee-based programs, whether it's uh, uh, different kinds of funding models, but also to see if, if startups can, can play a larger role than they've played in this university. So I just want to go over this and show in a slightly different way. Uh, if you remove all the negatives, whatever's left hopefully is the way to <laughs> forward. So I want to show you sort of what can go wrong as well. And that's why the, there's a knot in this title. But through that, I want to show what, what's the right approach in my, uh, from my experience in how to do this. I'd just like to thank uh, all the people involved. Uh, the name of my company is Nimbic. It was formerly uh, Fizzware. It's funded by uh, Madrona, WRF, and Austria. And also, we, of course, were lucky to work with many funding agencies and partners in putting together much of the research and also the products with, for this company, which happened over the last 10 years or so. So quickly, uh, Jenning introduced, I just wanted to tell you my background, which isn't very different from many other uh, people who go into academia, which is I got a PhD, and then I did do a small differences that I did work for a company, uh, Ansoft Corporation, which actually became uh, one of our, uh, our role models when we were doing our startup. It's a very large company. It was acquired for $850 million about six years ago. And it's a great place to actually, where I learned how to know the ropes for, for startups. I started in 2000 here at UW. And then uh, we, we founded Fizzware in 2006, 2007. It's, uh, there's a change of name that also happens. That's one of the interesting things in startups that you adapt as, as things change. And I did every role. Not, not every role was as enjoyable. Founder was very enjoyable. CTO was fun. CEO was not fun. And now I'm retired, so chief technologist and chairman, which means I'm back at the department full time. And there are other professional CEOs and CTOs doing that. But it was a great experience to go through this whole uh, transition from founding the company to being back at UW. So this company, Fizzware, originally now called Nimbic, was started in 2006. Uh, and the first funding round was with Medrona, who is a very supportive venture uh, company here in town. It works very closely with Department of Engineering, uh, College of Engineering, Computer Science and Engineering, and also now E. And we also had funding from WRF, Washington Research Foundation, again, a very uh, a powerful and, and supportive partner for, for our department. And our latest round, we also had investors from Chile, Austral Capital, who've also invested in other companies in, in UW. So this company, what it does is it produces software products, which are used by electronic 
uh, design companies, for example, the Intels and IBMs of the world. And the idea is that you try to solve the physics of the flow of, of electromagnetics or circuits equations through very large structures. For example, a package inside which you have a multi-core chip. You want to understand how this package will behave. Uh, what's the fastest signal you can route through this package? How much crosstalk is there? How much reflection? And so on. And the idea is to be able to do this in software rather than spending a lot of money trying to prototype this and then having to go back to your workbench. So, so this area is called electronic design automation. Uh, there are other people in the department as well as in the university who work in this space of EDA. And EDA itself is about a $4.5 billion per year um, uh, space of software in, in the larger scale of electronics. And typically these licenses cost quite a bit, they're about $50,000 per license. But remember what you're giving to the user is the ability not to have to prototype. If you take a chip to prototype and it doesn't work, you lose about $3 million on that, okay, just on putting a chip and then seeing that it didn't work, you lose about that, not counting the fab cost. Okay, a typical fab costs about $3 billion to make. Okay, so this is just, so compared to that, a license cost is, is very small. And recently there's a disruptive model as in many other areas of software. The, the fact that you now have very large and, and cheap clouds available, cloud computing from, for example, Amazon, Microsoft, uh, Azure. How can we use these to uh, do software where the demand is not constant. So instead of buying one license over one year, can I pay per, dem per on demand? That is, I have a, a fabrication run coming up. I want to do a very quick simulation. Maybe I need to use a lot, lot of computers, but I only need to do it for a couple of weeks. Why should I buy a, a license for the whole year? So that, that's called elastic demand, and, and cloud-based uh, uh, solutions are able to do that. In addition, if you have good parallel sim simulations, you can use the cloud as, as an effective uh, high-performance high computing cluster as well. So that's, that's the disruptive model which is happening in this space. So uh, as, in, as in most industries, there is a tail, which means that much of the work is required by about the top 20 semiconductors in the world. You, all, all the names which you are familiar with, from Apple to Samsung to uh, Intel, IBM, and so on. And then there's a long tail where there's a lot of need for electronic design, but you don't have the kind of uh, budgets which uh, large companies are able to spend. For example, one of the largest companies in the world, a chip manufacturer spends about $100 million per year on software, on actual electronic design automation software. Not every company can do that. Clearly, startups, startups can't do that. So there is this tail. It's not as long a tail as in, for example, the, the markets you see on, on web applications, because this is not every individual in the world. It's only every company, okay, every electronics company. But there's still a reasonably long tail, which you can attack by cloud-like uh, solutions. <laughs> And so, you, like in any company, we start with, with customers who are larger, like enterprise customers, uh, recently closed on a $1 million enterprise customer, and now you're attacking the, the cloud, the, the, through the cloud, you're attacking the tail. And the competition in this space, there's none yet, but that doesn't mean it won't show up. Okay? People are moving to the cloud model, and I mentioned on Ansoft before. So that was sort of the experience here, and the benefits, like most startups would say, well, we are faster, we are cheaper, we are more efficient, we are more accurate. And no, no surprise here, right? So that's, and it's all true, of course, right? There's no marketing here. But, but whether it's true or not, you'll see every company say that. We're faster, cheaper, better, right? And so uh, we say the same thing. And we have locations in, in Mountain View is, is, the, is the main office. We started here in Bellevue, figured out that the Bay Area is much more fertile in terms of customers, in terms of investors, in terms of hiring for, for people. So most electronic companies do end up in, in, in the Silicon Valley area. And we, we got a professional CEO, so I had to stop masquerading as a CEO and get someone who can actually do that job. And obviously, he's doing uh, a great job. So what are possible exits? Well, uh, since we're close to profitability, one of the ways is to keep growing, or so-called organic growth. That is, you keep growing without taking any more investment. Eventually, you hope you're big enough to uh, be an established company. The other is, in this space, there's a lot of acquisitions. Some are good acquisitions, some are very cheap acquisitions. And so there is a lot of uh, interest in, in this space for large companies to acquire uh, smaller companies. And a sort of an out-of-the-box exit for companies like these are if you get acquired not by a potential customer, but by someone else who can make money by having you as, uh, or not acquired by a potential competitor, but by someone who is actually a customer, for example, a semiconductor uh, company or a cloud company, which is a new model, because cloud companies are figuring out how to build more and more value for people who use the cloud. So based on this, here is my 10-step linear recipe for success. Okay. So notice that it's all on one slide, and there's a 
a cartoon on the right, so this is not meant to be serious. Okay, but let's see what's the 10 step linear recipe. Okay, think up a great new idea, whether you're a student, uh, research staff, or faculty here at UW. Get, get it funded, which nowadays is not that easy. Build your prototype and refine it right at UW. Find the initial adopters, you know, start doing some industrial grants without giving away IP. Form your company while you're still at UW. Uh, at UW. Start scaling up, get VC funding. Build your product, refine your product, build your user base, and now the important steps. Get all your timing right, okay, so, so that you don't make any mistakes. There's always luck involved, get lucky, okay, and then get rich. Okay, so this is your linear recipe for success. And if you, wanted, if you don't get bored, you can do this many times before you die or you get bored. And if you're still alive, okay, you can write a book, share your experiences, get richer by telling others how you did this. Okay? So nice linear approach, which never works. Okay? Maybe you know, we, we've read a lot of success stories about how everything just seemed to flow. Okay? It doesn't work this way. And uh, you know, obviously, we all know that. But the question is, why and, and what's the way forward? How, how to do this? So what I'm going to focus on, what not to do. Okay, so it's sort of going backwards, because there's a lot of, um, I would say, popular literature in this area, where you can buy books and, and they'll tell you exactly what to do. Most of it doesn't work, but it's still good to read those books from this viewpoint. Okay, that, that is what not to do. And then, as Sherlock Holmes said, you know, if you remove everything which doesn't work, whatever is left is going to work. Okay, so, so we're going to look at it that way. So what I'm going to try to focus on in this talk is, we are in a university, so there is a difference between uh, doing a startup out of your garage and being at a university and doing a startup. And I want to, sh to celebrate and show that this difference is something we can really exploit uh, to increase the probability of success. You know, startups are, are uh, of course, very low probability of success creatures in general, but how can we increase this probability of success given that we are part of a very high class university? Okay. So there are pitfalls to avoid and chasms to cross. Okay. These are words, of course, from, from business books, okay, you don't want to, a chasm is of course the difference from going from four customers to 400. How do you jump across that? Okay, and that's very well studied in, in business. But the claim that I want to make is that the, a university research based startup does not have to have this incredibly high uh, risk profile that you would do if two of you get together and set up a, a startup in a garage without having gone through the, the university system. So that's what I'm trying to say. You can mitigate a lot of risks by letting the risks happen at the university before you jump into the, into the startup. So the idea is if we can eliminate all the steps which don't work, hopefully we can get a better understanding of how to do this. It's not a linear process. It's not guaranteed success, of course. It is iterative. You've got to adapt. Uh, but hopefully, we can all build uh, in a way which goes from research to startup and solves real problems uh, in the real world. So again, this one of my uh, favorite heroes, of course, is Sherlock Holmes. He said, just eliminate the impossible, whatever's left however improbable it seems, is the truth. Okay, so we're going to eliminate the steps which don't work, and then it's up to you to figure out how to do the rest. Okay, so here is, for example, not the right ways to proceed. I was surprised that I went to this website, and there's a, is a, there's a calculator which will tell you what are the odds of success for you. Okay, and so it tells you how old, asks you how old are you, how many years of experience do you have, how much money do you have in the bank, okay, how big is your market which you're trying to attack? And then it'll come out with a number. And hopefully that's between 0 and 1 if this thing works. But um, this is, again, not a right way to, to uh, think. Because it's, it's your own uh, creativity which is going to change this probability in your favor. Okay? So these kind of sort of formulaic things are not going to work. But this is quite an extreme uh, step. So here's the first thing. People always say, start with the end in mind. Okay? This is the product. This is what I want to get to. Here's the customer. When you're at UW, when you're doing research, you can't do that, okay? Because hopefully all of, all of us are doing research which really is so cutting edge that we don't really know how it's going to be applied in five years or 10 years. That's what, why we are all here, okay? That's why we're not uh, in, in industry. That's why we're here as, as researchers, as, as faculty, and as students, hopefully, as many of you will go into these areas. So the, the problem is if you just focus on the end, there's a the danger of becoming sort of an arm of industry, which is never good in the long run, okay? Maybe in the short run, you might get some funding, you might get a little bit of product, but in the, in the long run, you're almost destroying what a university stands for, which is long-term research. Okay? So I think this is pretty important that don't have an end in mind when you're doing uh, necessarily your research at the initial part. So for example, uh, just to show you that how things sort of uh, evolve, it turns out, and this is work which came out of my lab last year, 
is that algorithms which were used for completely different applications, fast solution of physics, okay, things like uh, clustering of galaxies, interaction between particles, now have been mapped onto graphs. Okay, so what, what happened in, in space have now been ma mapped onto graphs, and they're able to predict things like how fast information diffuses, diffuses on a graph. Okay, so you're actually solving a wave equation on a graph, and that can be used for things like directed advertising. If you have a social network, who should you target so that you can maximize, for example, the, the spread of, of some word, if you're trying to create a cause or a movement or, or even a product, how do you actually disappear or diffuse that information? Okay, there's no way that when you're working on this physics problem that you would have thought of this as an example. Okay, so if I'd started with this as a goal, I would probably have said, let's see how Google has done it, let's go to PageRank, okay, and then we go down one path. But here it's, well, look at this algorithm, and it worked on, on space, we're able to map it to graph through some, some uh, transformations, and it has an application. Okay, so that's an example of why starting with the end in mind uh, doesn't work. Here's another example, which is that if you're trying to solve things on the cloud, the problem on, uh, one of the problems that it's not really being adopted by all industries is that people are concerned about hacking. Okay? Everyone believes that their own internal uh, uh, computing system is very, very secure, which is never true, but that's the belief. Right? That's the belief. If you are a large company, you say, well, I I'm completely in control of this. However, I'm not going to send information to the cloud because I don't know what's going to happen on the cloud. Someone can hack in. I don't know if you delete all the data. Okay, if that, that same computing hardware ends up in somebody else's hands later, can they actually extract some information? So one way people do that is to encrypt, right? to encrypt data and then work in the encrypted uh, domain. The problem is that if someone steals your key, you're back to where you started. If, if you, the key is stolen, it's as good as not being uh, encrypted. So again, to show you what can, what can happen is, and I'll show you the example later, but that the algorithms which are used to compute things, for example, you're solving a large matrix system, it turns out that same algorithm, which is actually for computation, can be used for encryption as well. Okay, so that's, again, a very different. So you're not going through any key-based schemes, which you know, all of us use some encryption in, in our daily lives. But instead of going through key-based, it turns out that if you're doing some computation, that computation, some, some intermediate steps in the computation can act like uh, encoding scheme. Okay, so that's another way that if you just started and said, well, I want to do encoding, you'd probably jump straight to a key-based uh, encoding. So just, again, an example of why not having the end in mind is actually a, a good thing. Okay. The other one is don't be a hero and try to do it all on your own. We've got a lot of support around us. I have no idea what this guy is trying to do. Okay. I think that's a big body of water down there and a large slope, but anyway, so don't try to do it all on your own, because we tend to, and all of us, and we're all guilty of this to some extent, that we feel we are gonna solve all the world's problems ourselves. Especially in a, in a startup, it's a very stressful uh, situation, so it's better if you have, for example, multiple founders, not too many to, to cause confusion, but try not to do it alone. I think that's something that, that helps. For example, in my case, my senior students and I were, were, were in it together, okay, and they were able to take both the risk and, and the reward from that. And so again, that is a, a benefit. Also, being in UW, there's a lot of people you can talk to, faculty, people who've done it before, uh, the technology transfer, uh, uh, um, C4C, as well as business people, and a large uh, set of angels and VCs. So it's good to be able to connect to these people early, even if you feel your, your idea is not yet uh, ready for, uh, for prime time. And it's also important to understand what the commercialization process means. How is it different from research? How do I not give up my IP too early? Okay, how do I do the right valuation? All of these things are, are things you can learn. There's enough resources here at UW to do that. This is another thing that researchers are often guilty of, which is like, oh, my method is the best. There's no question it's the best because three papers have been accepted. But it's below my dignity to actually show how this will impact the real world. Someone else will pick it up. It's true that that does happen quite often, but I think more and more what's happening is that the people who know the technology best are also potentially the best suited to, to push it out to solve real problems. Okay, you may not have to be the CTO or the CEO, but you need to be involved. So it's good to go beyond things like just consulting or board memberships. Uh, and of course, technology licensing is one very good solution for a class of, of uh, IP. But in general, if you can get your feet wet in actually getting uh, this technology to market, it really opens up, whether you're a student, whether you're a researcher or faculty, really opens, opens up to the process so that if you have to do it again or, or advise others, you learn a lot from it. So that's, again, my advice is 
actually get your feet wet in, in doing this. So Gary Locke, who was uh, here in our state, actually came up with, and that's not an oxymoron up there, government wisdom. Right? This actually is true in this case, which is an interesting statement saying that, and you can read it, okay, that it's not a question of hoping that there's research and somebody else will come down the road to commercialize. The, the idea is that if you can do it yourself, you're probably best, you know your technology best. You know what the strengths are, the benefits are. So if you really believe in it, I think it's, it's the right time to, uh, in this uh, uh, climate as well, it's the right time to expand and actually put this into, into the real uh, world. Now going on to a few more nitty gritties, and this is something that I also learned the hard way, and of course many others uh, make this mistake too, that is we love to publish. Okay, we want tenure as faculty, if we are students, we want to get a really good CV out so that we can get the best jobs. But if there's any IP involved, you're also giving that up. You have one year in which to, to, um, to in the US, you have one year in which to protect whatever you're sending out. So it is important to work with uh, here technology transfer to figure out what is the impact of any public disclosure. Okay, it's not just a journal paper. It could be a conference paper, it could be a presentation, it could be a meeting. And it is important to at least know that, that if, you're, if you do this at the wrong time, you may lose a lot of IP. Okay, so being more aware of IP is important, and sometimes this can be taken to an extreme, so I'll talk a little bit more about this, but in general, it's good to know that public disclosure can end up, uh, can make you have no, no more uh, uh, ownership rights on your, on your IP. Okay. So why do we want to protect the research IP? Well, there are many reasons, and some of them are more, let's say, uh, good for investment. So for example, investors sometimes will ask you, what is your portfolio of patents? And you can say, well, I don't have any, but nobody else can do what I can do. You know, that's not a very strong statement to make. People say, well, you may believe that, but you know, what's, what's the proof? So, so that's one thing. The other is patents are nowadays a very good form of defense. Okay, so it's actually a good thing. If you have your own patents, you can use these as a, a negotiation step later as, as you grow. And so that's another reason why, why you're doing that. Uh, you can also attack the landscape early, which means you can figure out what are the holes, not just in terms of patents, but in terms of ideas by looking at what's already out there. So studying that space is, is also important. But as, as a last point, I just want to point out that sometimes it's actually better not to patent because you're sort of giving up some aspect of the idea when the patent comes out. So sometimes just a copyright on your code, if you're writing a lot of code, or a trade secret, which is really making sure that you have some secret sauce, uh, as the common word is, but you don't want anyone to know what that is, even in patent form. Okay, so there is some uh, give and take as to how much patenting versus how much trade secrets to do, especially in the, in the software and uh, computation world. So this is where uh, I think we have to understand that not everything we do as, a, as researchers is, is that good. Okay, it may get published, okay, it may even win us an award, but not all of it is good in terms of making commercial impact. So patents are expensive. The cheapest patent just in the US may cost you between fifteen to twenty thousand dollars. If you start going international, you may spend a hundred thousand dollars on a patent. So so I don't think people should use this as a beauty contest or bean counting. I have fifteen patents, how many do you have? Okay, that that's not useful at all. So that's why it's important. We need to be brutally understand, uh, brutally, brutally honest and understand is is there something really in, there in what we are doing. And sometimes we don't know the answer because we don't understand the market. But that's again important to connect to the people who may be able to help you here. Okay. Resources are finite, so you can't patent everything even if you think they are, they are good ideas. So that's another thing to, to focus on patent, but not everything. Okay. So here's an example. This is a, a nice idea that a student of mine and I had, and it's really more the student's idea than mine. But the, the idea is you have a device uh, which is in your pocket and it's running out of power. And this is, this is the field of wireless power, which we, we have other people in the department and the, in the university working on. But this was a different way. You have a scanning antenna array, uh, which is uh, a one-time installation in your roof, which, which receives a beacon from, from a uh, device which is running out of power. And then uh, these are called reflect arrays. They're able to send back power exactly in the same direction in which they received a, a beacon. Okay, there's no electronics required. The, uh, the antenna and the uh, interconnect around the antenna does that. So if it receives a signal at some angle, it sends back power straight at that angle. Okay, so it looks like a really nice idea. But it's not commercially viable at, at all. Any thoughts why? The lack of, uh, okay, so one thing is you'll have to actually add on a lot of hardware to a device to make it compatible with this, that's true. But let's say I did that. Even then, it's not commercially viable. 
Say that again. OK, so efficiency. But let's say we got enough power to actually power the device, and we are not worried about efficiency. There's, there's still a bigger concern. I wouldn't want to be in this room. That's the hint. OK. <laughs> Okay, you probably get burnt by, by the amount of power that you need. Okay, so, so FCC will not allow this. Uh, and so the only role for this kind of uh, technology is in what's called trickle charging, which is very low amount of charging, which is happening all the time, which might be useful, for example, for biomedical devices. Okay, but if you try to charge a laptop with this device, I think you'll have the, uh, you know, every three-letter agency in your house very quickly because you'll be doing things which are sort of military-like. Okay, so, so yes, yeah, so it's a nice research idea, but... It's a, it's a field intensity and cost trade off. It's either going to be really expensive or you're going to have to put in so much uh, protection around where, where you're putting this device that you're not going to have any benefits. And so you can use it as a trickle charger, but uh, you know, it will give you very slow charging and so on. It's a nice idea, but it's not commercially, commercially viable. Here's another one. Okay, this is something our lab spent time on. Again, there are other people in the university who've done this. The idea is we have these uh, beautiful devices, which are called labs on chip, which are basically microfluidic devices, which are uh, very low cost. And the idea is that you can do everything you can do in a medical lab, you can do in the field. And so this gives you point of care uh, ability for, uh, for places where you may not have large uh, medical infrastructure. And so the idea was, well, if you argue that much of the, the electronic revolution, Moore's law, has been driven by, by simulation tools. I think no one can argue with that. It was SPICE, the circuit simulator, and all its uh, derivatives, which really helped push design. Because you could design with a few transistors. Once you had millions, it was difficult to do that without some uh, simulation. So the idea was, well, maybe the reason that labs on chip are not yet scaling as Moore's law is scaling is because they're not simulation tools available to do that. OK, maybe. And so we did that. Uh, not, not everything, because this is a much more complex space because of all kinds of fluidic effects which don't show up in, 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 elec in electrical simulation. But again, this is not a very useful, viable commercial idea. Not because in this case uh, you're going to kill anyone because of intensity of, of anything. There's actually no commercial traction here because the overall market is tiny. Okay, the overall market of lab and chip right now is about 300 million, okay, which is, uh, and this is maybe about a year old compared to a 300 billion electronics um, market and 30 billion dollar semiconductor market. And also, the complexity of the physics is such that you really have to get much more into the detail. It's as if you were to spend all your time understanding the physics of one transistor, okay, which was done very early on in the 40s to 60s. And that was, you created behavioral models or equivalent circuits which went into larger scale. That has not yet happened. So you're still focusing on a lot of physics, multi-phase flow, mi mixing, and so on which has not yet happened. So there may be a time in the future where these tools will propel forward, but this is, from a commercial viewpoint, completely the wrong time to pursue this kind of technology. So these are two examples where there may be good ideas. You may have done a lot of work, but they're not necessarily commercially uh, viable. So I, I'm, I managed to get two, two pictures on the web, which make no sense, but I still found them, which is, I, I don't know. I think this is some cost-cutting measure for some <laughs> Air Force. but. But it doesn't look very useful. This thing just looks really scary. Okay, and it even has a Swiss Air logo on it. But I don't know. I found that. But but the idea is that people are really fond of this statement that doing a startup is like flying a plane while building it. Okay, that that rarely works. Okay, you'll end up with things like this. Okay, and again the idea is that yes, if you are, you know, if you don't have resources, if you have this brilliant idea, it's two people working in a garage, you might have to take this mentality. I agree. But once, since you're in a university, you really are in an environment where you can take advantage of a lot of resources, and you don't have to have, you know, try to fly planes like these. You can have more airworthy things in there. Okay. And the, the reason for that is sort of mixing or marination or a, a nonlinear process where there is more time. Okay. When, when you're thinking in terms of startups, time is measured in months, if you're lucky. Okay. In, in research, hopefully, we are measuring time in, in years. Okay. And that time gives you a lot, lot of advantage in terms of trying out ideas, throw, throwing them out, without the market-driven pressure which you have in a startup, okay, in, in any startup. And so that's something that we have to use a lot more uh, when you're at a university. Of course, there's no algorithm, right? If there was an algorithm for success, it would have been done, and there were, you know, it would have no longer been a creative process. So you have to do, it has to be an iterative process, which we are doing in, in the research lab itself. And one of the benefits is 
if, if you don't make money, there are no unhappy people, right? Unlike in a, in a startup. Maybe your funding agencies, but very often they are, they are more tolerant than, than people who are putting in their own money. So I think this, this phase in a university is something that you can really use. And once you have your uh, research done, then you can try to fly your plane. That, does, that still doesn't look too airworthy, but it's, it's at least going to fly. Okay? And now you can do the, the standard things that you do in a startup, which is pick the right team, find funding, okay? all the standard things that you see, okay, which is put deliverables, put milestones, and strategize as to what the market is, what the available market is. But that needs to be done after you've taken out all the risks from the, from the research. Okay? Another thing which happens is people get very attracted by money. Okay, and this happens to all of us, money as in, wow, I'm getting resources to do uh, startups. And quite often, this is where VCs can jump in, and, and they'll, they're taking a risk, they always take risk, but in some sense, you can also lose a lot of control, right? If VCs come in too early. There are good VCs, and there are VCs who are more hands-off, hands-on, uh, or hands-off, okay, those are both good or bad things, but, uh, so there's a tendency to start using this money too early, to start building your team according to some, uh, org chart, right, I need a CTO, I need a CEO, I need a VP of sales, and so on. And if you do this too early, you're going to burn out your money and not have a product. So there is such a thing as raising money too early, and that shouldn't be done. Again, the caveat is that there are investors who at the right time are more invaluable than you can, than any other step in, in starting the startup. And once you're starting your company, don't treat it like an extension of a research lab. Okay, this is also something which, uh, as researchers, we end up doing, saying, wow, you know, I have Lab X in, in the department, now I have a new company, I'm going to use the same methods, I'm going to try 10 ideas here, okay? My ex students are now employees here, and, you know, they have the same research mindset, so now I have two research labs, one funded by uh, a federal agency, one funded by VC. Okay, that's, a, again, the wrong, uh, you know, wrong attitude, and this can happen pretty easily, because most of us think, think like researchers. And sometimes it's even tempting to do things like mix different kinds of funding. Okay, this can also be, be difficult because each of these funding comes with a deliverable, comes with some, some plan and some promise. It's not always a good idea. Sometimes if you can tailor your SBIR, which is the, the uh, small business uh, funding which comes from the, essentially from the US government, if it can be tailored in the right way, it can be very useful because it doesn't take away any equity. But if done the wrong way, you might go down the wrong path. So again, it's important that you, when you get different types of mix of funding, be careful how to do that. And this is a more a company idea, which is never, never hire until you absolutely have to, which is you're saying, without such a person, our company is going to die tomorrow. Okay? That's the time to hire. Okay? Or maybe wait one more day and make sure you still feel the same way the next day, then hire. Okay? So it's, because once you hire, it's very, diff it's much easier to, to hire than to you know, say, well, it didn't work out, you know, let's, let's get rid of people. That's the worst thing which happens in companies. So you've got to hire very, very carefully. And these are sort of, uh, sort of archetypes of what, what works for CEOs. Typically, CEOs are outward looking, they're visionary, they're good marketers. And CTOs tend to be inward looking, but they're very good, very detailed, uh, very, very uh, detail oriented, so they can put your product together. It's very rare that you can have one person doing both of them, so you shouldn't one shouldn't feel that you can do both tasks. You have to figure out what your strengths are or find someone else to do both of these. The tech team, and again, there are a lot of, uh, sort of this folklore on how big a tech team should be. Some people say five people or seven people, no more. But in general, it has to be really small, hand-picked, and really incentivized, which means either as co-founders or, or something which is built not on salary, but on, on the company doing well, which means on stock or on, or on growth. Uh, and the sales team is, only once the product is ready. There's no such, no bigger problem than a sales team who, who's brought in too early. Why? They don't have a product to sell. They're getting frustrated. They're incentivized by selling. They'll push the, the tech team to sell, right? And, and you, you'll end up selling a product which isn't ready. So, so the sales team has to be pushed out as much as possible, and other people can do sales roles until the sales team is quickly. This is an unfortunate thing, but I think it has to be done, okay? If it turns out there is no fit, then that, that uh, disconnect or, or that separation has to happen quickly. It's best for everybody, for the VCs, for the person involved, rather than spreading this out over time. And this is not a happy event, but it can be, it can be mitigated by hiring very carefully. Okay, so, so if you hire carefully, hopefully you, you never have to do this step. And this is an interesting one, which uh, I've learned from other people's uh, uh, experiences as well. It's very, very tempting to use consultants because they're cheaper than hiring someone. 
Okay, but consultants, what are consultants? They're mercenaries, right? They pay for hire, you know, they say, uh, you give us so much money, we'll do this. They don't have the same passion as you have for your product, right? They're coming in to do a certain role. And maybe you're doing a market research, trying to figure out how big the market is. If they understand the market, they might do that. But sometimes people end up uh, using consultants a lot because on their burn, which is the amount of money you're spending per, per month, it looks very nice, right? Maybe it's one third of a salary instead of a full salary. But overall, since they're not really incentivized beyond the money you're paying them, it's not a good idea to use too many consultants. Okay, so really you want your team to be handpicked, a bunch of people who are, who are really motivated and excited about the product, and that's, that's your company. And this is uh, something you just want to point out, that there is a, a the sort of power of inner you know, intangibles, you can call it whatever you want, right? And depending on how religious or spiritual or whatever you want. But the idea is that all these positive things do actually play. If you believe in something, it's much easier for that to come true. So just to, to point that out, that don't uh, try to do things without believing in them. So here's a summary of the don'ts, okay, which is stuff don't do when you're at UW and don't do at Nyoko. Okay, so you can read through this. But as we all know, the brain is not good at uh, processing don'ts. Okay, the brain actually processes don'ts as do's. It doesn't understand until an alternative is given. So let's do these in terms of positives. Okay, so what are the things which you can help go from UW? Okay, do start with high risk, open-ended, innovative research. Okay, don't, uh, there's no uh, benefit in trying to water down that step. Do engage with others early, don't be lone wolves. Okay, be willing to take the plunge yourself. Whatever, as much as you are willing to take. It's not always necessary to be a founder, okay, but to be involved in some stage. Okay, understanding how to protect IP is critical whether you protect all your IP or not but you have to understand the, the steps involved. And related to that is be critical. Okay, just because the paper is published doesn't mean it's a great idea, doesn't mean it's a great commercial idea as well. So being self-critical is, is important. Get all the high-risk stuff done first at UW. Okay, that's where the difference is, that you don't need to go run after venture money or angel money until you can get much of the high-risk taken care of. Here, making a lot of mistakes, okay, and even publishing some of the mistakes. Okay, some of our best papers are actually papers after five years, you say, well, that was the wrong way to do it, and this is the right way to do it, right? That's just, that's just how uh, research progresses. So doing all the high-risk research first is actually very important. Once you're at the company, it's, it's now you are in this mode which you know, every uh, book, book writer talking about entrepreneurship will say. That is, now be focused, have a market, have a product, you know, raise, re raise money for the right reasons at the right time. Don't take too much money, plan why, what you want to do with the money, have a very small team of really incentivized people rather than scaling out with this money. And hopefully that will give you, uh, along with positivity, will give you belief in, in pushing this forward. So that, I think, is the 10-step the process. So I have this small figure which I want to show, which really looks like a, a two-stage microfluidic device again. And the idea is that there's really two nonlinear processes happening okay, when, you're in a com when you're at a university trying to do a startup. Okay, unlike when you're just at a company, which is stage one, which is again very nonlinear, we all researchers know that, very high risk, forward looking, okay, and open ended, okay, and it's also self assessed, which is, and peer assessed. If our papers are not accepted, there must be a reason for that. Okay, so, and it's got a long time constant, a few years. Okay, so this step is what takes away the risk from, from the second step, which is when you're doing your startup. And this is what gives the benefit of being at a university when you're doing a startup. And then you go through, and this is one path, going through C4C, for example, which is our technology transfer office. And then once you're at the company, you're in a different mode. It's still nonlinear, it's still adaptive, it's still risky, but it's more focused on the customer, on the market. Okay, and the important thing is not to do the research here and not to do the market focus here. Okay, so to keep these two things very separate, so that you have this flow. And notice there's no flow coming back here, right? What, is, what would that be called? One word for that would be conflict of interest, right, if, if done wrongly. But if you have products which go back to your lab and actually benefit your research, that's actually a great thing. So you know, if you write a simulator which makes your next generation of students even more productive, that's, that's a fantastic side effect. Okay? But I'm just showing you the, the step forward to, to getting to the company. Okay, and what I do want to point out is that although we think of research and, and uh, doing startups is very different, if you look, research and entrepreneurs are pretty similar. Okay? They're both creative, they're both often contrarian or, or rebellious thinkers. 
Uh, they're fighting incredible odds, all of us do. Okay? We're trying to make impact. We're willing to put commitment into it. It's not just a job, right? We're doing more than that. And it's really the same zeal which drove, whether it's a scientist or, or an engineer it's, or an entrepreneur, it's really very similar. It's the same thing, we're a mix of hard work, smart work, and of course luck, we can't get away from that. The difference is that there are two different stages. We shouldn't mix the research and the, the startup stage. That's the only lesson here, which I think I've learned as well, which is to keep these stages separate, not just because you want to keep things clean, but also because it's the most efficient. Okay, you can do all the research in one stage, and all the market focus in the other stage. Okay, so I'd just like to conclude uh, here with this quote, which is from uh, Getty, which talks again about the fact that once you commit to something, okay, and this is something I, I've seen in my life, others have seen, once you commit to something, things tend to change. It's, it's, it is true that once you put your energy behind things, and so the difference between saying, well, this IP is useful, let's find someone to, to commercialize, versus I believe it's useful, and I'm going to push it. The, the differences between these two in terms of impact can be quite significant. So again, my uh, uh, lesson from this and also my, my uh, reasoning behind giving this talk is to make sure that people understand that, that the right amount of tech transfer and, and startups from a university is actually beneficial for everybody. Okay? It's not something that people used to look down upon many years ago as, well, we are, we are scientists or we are professors and, and there's a, a separate world out there. It's no longer true, and I think it's, it's important to see that and, and benefit from it. Okay, so I think that's my last slide, so thanks for your time and happy to take any questions. <laughs> questions? Uh, what do you think about incentivizing consultants with uh, investable stock options? Okay, so just repeating the question, Howard's question is, uh, how about incentivizing consultants which things which are beneficial for the growth of the company, like, like stock and so on. I think that's a, that's a great uh, step. So there, really what you're hoping to do is maybe get a future employee, often. And you're starting someone, and they're testing you out, and you're testing them out, and they might end up as a future employee, especially if they incentivize your stock. I think that's, that's a very good way of using consultants. And, and no, really no negatives, because you can... Either side can pull the plug without any problems, and if there's a good fit, you can move forward. Absolutely. <coughs> Other questions? Yeah. Do you have any comments about the change in the patent law that uh, now is first to file as opposed to first to invent? Yes. So, uh, so uh, the question is about the, the change in patent law, which is first to file versus first to invent. Uh, it just puts the onus on really being careful about when you have new IP. To, to push it forward even quicker. So I would say it, it makes us more aggressive as to pushing patenting. So I, I, I can't comment on whether it's the right thing or not. I think in some sense I would say it's not the right thing. I mean, if someone has patented something, has invented something and can prove it, I think they should still have rights to that. But you know, that's outside this discussion. So I would say to take advantage of that is really be diligent about whether what you're doing has IP and going after it even more aggressively. I remember you mentioned Ansoft never did any patents. So how do you think they protect the IP? Right, so Ansoft, uh, so Richard's question is, uh, Ansoft is a large company, uh, went public, then got acquired for a very large multiple. They had, I believe, 90 million revenue, but got acquired for 860 million, so almost 10x. And uh, they had a very small number of patents or no patents. And so, uh, so Richard, your question is, how, how, how did that strategy succeed? So firstly, they were very, very early in that market. So they were able to move ahead of competition from maybe for 15 years there was no competition. So that barrier to entry became very large even without any, any patents. And by then it was too late for them to patent because everything was out there in some form. So I believe, I think if, they, if that company did things again they would have done more patents now. But I think it was a question of timing and also the fact that they were so far ahead that they were able to exploit that. I don't think it was so much about trade secrets and hiding things as just being so far ahead, I think that's. Other questions? Howard, one more. Yeah, and then after that. So we have some really great international students who aren't allowed to work in the US um, who might be ideal candidates for university spin-offs. 
Do you have any suggestions and advice on how to handle that? Fantastic. I mean, we should get our senators here. But I was at a biotech summit where the recommendation was anyone who gets an advanced degree from a, a good university should have the green card stapled to their, their diploma. Okay, and I think that's, that's actually a great idea. I, I don't know if that will ever be accomplished. The problem, you're absolutely right. So, for example, you have an H-1B, which is a high-tech uh, visa. As a startup, you can get an H-1B as long as you have five people in that startup who are already eligible to, to be in the U.S. So in some sense, the sixth employee can be an international student. And there are other ways. C4C, again, is a benefit here because you can, for example, be a postdoc. You can have other uh, steps in between. But you're right, there's still that gap. If you're a really smart international student, you want to do something on your own or with someone else, it's quite difficult to just start a company here. That's, that's true, absolutely. Again, I think the, the, the staple green card would solve that problem. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. On, on that whole process of commercialization, you probably get a lot of advice from the different entities along the way, from the colleagues here, from C4C, from funding sources. How do you filter? Uh, is, are they, would you say that the advice was in general in concert, or was it all <laughs> disparate and you had to filter? So the question is, if you get so much advice from different parties, is it all in concert, or is it is other things you have to filter out? So uh, it's never in concert. You know, every everyone has a different way of looking at it. So I think the only way to learn is to sort of believe some of the advice you need, move forward, and then test test it out, and then quickly retract if you feel it's going the wrong way. Okay. So and after a while, you start realizing in your situation wh whose advice is, is valuable. It may just be in where you are, and they they are connected to you. So it's really a lot of, of testing. And that's why uh, sort of this nonlinear adaptive process even applies to taking advice, right? So, so someone says, well, you should have hire 10 people tomorrow. So an expensive way to do that is to hire 10 people and then fire seven people, right? But if someone says, well, just keep it at three, then maybe you take that advice first and say, okay, let me try, try with three people. And wow, this actually works. I don't need more people. So you sort of have to maybe do a, 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 an ordering of all the advice you get and then use your own intuition. But as you make more mistakes and learn from them, I think this becomes an easier task as you, as you move forward. And you can always take my advice now, right? So since I've done it, no. That's <laughs> Other questions? Another thing is not to be shy. Okay, otherwise you can't do a startup. So questions? Yes. Sometimes governments or municipalities will, will create a space which is intended to physically host startups. Are those useful? So John's question is about incubation spaces for, for new startups. And uh, inside, you mean inside universities or in general? So I think incubators in general are a great idea. I think they, they work. Uh, and there have been examples in the Bay Area and so on where uh, just that feeling of being in 10 offices where everyone around you is also doing new ideas. It actually works very well for early stage. But I think there's a point where you have to move out of that very quickly. So I think for early stage incubators are really a good idea. But they, they can't really scale is my belief. I think from that point on you need to move on. Any other questions? Yeah. You mentioned the SBIRs before, and my experience with them is pretty limited. But is it sometimes the case that they expect you to commercialize it, maybe with a partner or something later on? So can right. you try and fit that in as you know, pending your successful research? Right, so the question is on SBIs and how to use them towards research. Again, the rightly timed SBIs, rightly focused, are really good because they don't take away any equity. And at the end of it, you may promise a product to one program manager or one defense agency or one government agency, but it gives you a lot of, of resources. So uh, phase one is a small phase, typically, and then phase two is where all the money is spent. And then they, they propose a phase three, which is where you, you, you basically develop with a commercial partner at a larger scale. Now, that funding may come from somewhere else. The danger is if you're already on phase three, sort of, you're already VC funded, and then you say, I want to augment with SPIs because I don't want to lose more funding, that can take you off on, on different directions. But I think starting with SBIR and moving out is a very good model to, uh, to, to pursue. So, so and there's a, a significant amount of funding every year. So I think that's something the university and researchers should go after. So. Other questions? Okay. No more okay. questions. Yeah. Give uh, Victor another big hand.